Well, hello, hello, all my amazingly beautiful Zodiac family and friends. My name is Libra Empress, and this is another episode of Terror and Tarot with Libra Empress. Today we have a reading for Three Unsettling Hospital Horror Stories by IMR Entertainment. Without further ado, let's get started, shall we? I'm a doctor and it's not only our job, but also our responsibility to take care of the patient. But not every patient is the same. Back when I was working in a small town hospital, I was young and new to the profession. But it only took me a few days to get accustomed to the workers and patients there. There were four of the doctors and we all reported to the head of our department, Miss Saunders. She was a tough person to impress, being honest. Every doctor was terrified of her. Not a single mistake could go unnoticed by her. I wanted to prove myself, hence I showed effort in my work. To do so, I had to take a lot of night shifts. I lived alone, distant from my family, so I didn't mind staying at the hospital most of the nights. All the patients called me Dr. Cooper. There were patients of various age groups, but there was this one little girl named Tierra. She was probably the youngest patient in the hospital at the time. She was there before my joining. Anyways, Tiara was a lovely child. She often roamed the corridors and talked to the other patients. Mostly, she was always on her own. One night, I was doing a night shift. I went to take my usual rounds. I was walking in the long, empty corridor when I heard two people talking in a very low voice. It was late, and every patient was supposed to be asleep by then. I followed the sound, and it came from cabin number 203. As I opened the door and switched on the room light, I found Tierra standing near the patient's bed. She smiled at me mysteriously, but my sudden appearance didn't startle her at all. She smartly said, Hello, Dr. Cooper. Tiara, this is way past your bedtime. What are you doing here? Nothing. I just came to say goodbye to George. George was the patient of 203. He recently had a major operation. Even though Tierra looked calm to me, I noticed George's face. He was scared and extremely pale. I thought Tierra's sudden arrival might have shocked him, so I said in a soft voice, Tierra, you can't roam like this at night. Come on, let's take you back to your bed. Then I looked at George and said, I'll send Nurse Martha for a quick check. She'll give you a pill to help you with sleep. You need to rest now. I then escorted Tierra to her ward. She went to bed without saying anything. This small encounter didn't worry me at all until the next morning. I went home around four after finishing my night shift. It was my day off, so I slept the entire day. The next day at work, when I was passing by room 203, I thought to check on George. But after opening the room door, I saw another patient was sleeping on his bed. I saw a nurse walking in the corridor. Excuse me, sister, where is George? He was in this cabin. Oh, you mean the patient in this room? He died yesterday, doctor. You didn't know? What? How? He was already suffering from cardiovascular disease, but he wasn't recovering. Surprisingly, he had a heart attack yesterday. Dr. O'Hara signed his death certificate. You can ask her. She will be able to give you all the details. The nurse walked away, and I stood cluelessly in the corridor. Suddenly, something weird came to my attention. I remembered, when I asked Tierra what she was doing in George's cabin, she said she came to say goodbye to George. But why goodbye? She was supposed to say goodnight, right? I went to Tierra's cabin. She was sitting on her bed and coloring pictures. Without wasting a single second, I asked her, Tiara, why did you go to George's room to say goodbye? Shouldn't you be wishing him goodnight? Tierra's face changed color. She fumbled, saying, I, I, I said goodnight. You heard it wrong. Suddenly, she looked behind my shoulder as if someone was standing behind me and watching her. I turned back immediately, but no one was there. The cleaning staff came and started to mop the floor. Tierra started coloring again. I went back to work with confusion in my mind. The entire day, I couldn't concentrate on my work. This unusual thought kept bugging me. Why did Tierra say goodbye to George? 
Did she know he was about to die? A week passed and I almost forgot about it. One night, I was making my usual rounds. I was walking on the second floor corridor when I saw Tierra come out of room 706 and slowly walk down the stairs. Room 706 recently took a patient with a serious head injury. I went inside and saw the woman was awake. Who is it now? Oh, it's you, doctor. How are you feeling, Corey? I feel a bit dizzy, doctor. Hmm, did someone come to you before me? Yes, a little girl came. She said her name is Tierra. What was she doing here? Did she say something to you? Yes, she was a sweet child, but I think she said it wrong. Said what wrong? I guess she meant to say goodnight, but instead she told me goodbye. Weird, huh? My heartbeat got faster. I put Corey back to bed and came back to my chamber. Deep down in my heart, I knew what was coming. The next morning, Corey passed away. I got this strong belief that Tierra has a weird ability to know when a patient's time has come. But I couldn't tell anyone about this because no one would believe me. There was nothing I could do because she wasn't harming anyone. Just a little girl bidding goodbye to patients whose deaths are near. After two more incidents like this, I couldn't keep it in. I went straight to the receptionist, Kathy, and asked her, How long has Tierra been here? Kathy looked at me and said, Who? Tierra. The girl in the intensive care ward. Don't you see how she sneaks into the rooms of the patients? I don't know why, but I feel there's something very wrong with this kid. What are you saying, Dr. Cooper? We don't have any patient named Tierra. No child patient is even admitted to the hospital right now. Are you okay? W what are you saying? I have been talking to this girl for the last few days. Check the register. She's in the intensive care ward. Cooper, please come to my office. I turned back and saw Miss Saunders standing behind me. I followed her to her cabin with a messed up mind. After entering, we sat down and she said in a low voice, Did you see Tierra? How does she look, Cooper? Is she happy? What? Please tell me what's going on. Kathy just said there's no one here by that name. And now you, you, you're asking me about this girl. What the hell is happening? <laughs> Miss Saunders couldn't control her tears. She started to cry terribly. After crying for some time, she looked at me and said, Tierra's my daughter. The week before you joined here, I brought her to work. Her father was supposed to come and pick her up. I was working while she roamed around the halls playing on her own. She was playing on the stairs and somehow her legs slipped and she fell from third floor to second floor. We admitted her to this hospital due to her immensely critical condition, but she... She died. I couldn't believe what I just heard. The ground beneath my feet got swept away. I felt my heart stopped. Tierra is dead? Oh my God. I stood in her cabin speechless, horrified. Miss Saunders said, I saw her at night roaming in these corridors, but I blamed my mind. But now, I think she's still here. You must be the second person to hear her. Can you see her now? Miss Saunders didn't give me time and switched off the light of the room. Tell me, Cooper, can you see her now? I was shit scared that moment, but still, I rolled my eyes around the entire room, and right then, someone spoke behind my neck. Goodbye, Dr. Cooper. Before starting the story, I would suggest you guys to go subscribe to the channel. It turns out that most of you guys who watch me aren't actually subscribed. So, if you like the content and want to support the channel, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. I am Julia. I work in the state hospital as a nurse. Hospitals are probably the only place that bluntly depicts the reality of life and death. When a patient recovers, we, the medical helpers, feel joy in their smile, whereas when a patient dies, we grieve with their family too. With time and experience, Nurses train themselves to deal with the toughest situations. But when this incident took place, I was a new nurse at our hospital and only been working there for a couple of months. I was working in an emergency ward. We used to get anything and everything. A naive teenage girl slashed her wrists, obsessing over her first breakup. A man getting involved in a car accident or 
got into fights leading to physical injuries. Cases of these sorts were common for us. But this one case will never go away from my mind. There was this one boy named Arnold who got admitted over a suicide attempt. When his folks brought him to us, he was covered in blood. Arnold was sitting in the park with his friends when suddenly he got up and ran towards a speeding oil truck. No doubt the truck hit him hard. He was left with a very serious head injury and multiple fractures on his body. His parents were sobbing and crying the entire time. A unit of three doctors and three nurses, including me, did his surgery. But unfortunately, due to massive blood loss and shock, Arnold went to a vegetative state. A state of complete unconsciousness with some eye opening and periods of wakefulness and sleep is called the vegetative state. The boy was about 14 years old. Everyone in the hospital felt extremely bad for this kid and his parents. I was assigned to keep a check on him. His body laid on the bed the entire time. His eyes were always still and open, staring at the ceiling all the time. The only time I felt he is alive is when he shut his eyes to sleep after dinner. His random eye movements used to freak me out sometimes. Suppose I was sitting next to him after dinner and reading him a story. His eyes remained closed the entire time. Soon, I realized he has fallen asleep, so I got up and switched off the lamp near his head. I was leaving when I remembered I left my phone on the table near him, so I went back and switched on the table lamp to find it, and right at that moment, I saw Arnold's eyes were wide open, looking at me. Middle of the night, being face to face with such unusual eye contact, no doubt creeped me out. These kinds of events often took place. One more mystery that always haunted my mind was, why Arnold tried to take his own life. Slowly I started to notice changes in Arnold's motor skills. The doctors were really happy to see his speedy recovery. They assured his parents that maybe in some months, Arnold regains his consciousness. His mom came to visit him almost every other day. One day, I was changing his medicine chart when three schoolboys, same age as Arnold, entered his cabin with an average height man. He was wearing glasses and formals. I guessed he might be a school teacher, and these boys are Arnold's school friends. The boys talked to Arnold and wished him to get well soon. The man sat next to Arnold and held his hand. As soon as the man did so, I noticed a slight rise in Arnold's pulse rate. The man said in a soft, caring voice, Oh, Arnold, we all miss you very much. Get well soon. We are waiting for you. My heart cried out of his friends and teacher. Within 10 minutes of their leaving, Arnold's heartbeat started to increase rapidly. And within five seconds, his body started to shake like a mad dog on the bed. He was having a seizure. Doctors rushed in with medicine and managed the situation. The entire night, I sat in his cabin and watched him with wide eyes. We had to stop the visiting hours for a while. One more shock or seizure would have caused a heart attack, so we had to be strict. After a week, we finally let his mom come and visit him. She requested us to let her stay the night in his cabin even though it was against the rule of the hospital. But seeing the poor mother, that one time, we had to bend the rules. I decided to stay with him too, like always. There was a small couch in his cabin. Miss Palmer sat on it, and I sat on the chair nearby. Around 2.30 a.m. in the morning, I got up to get some coffee. Arnold's eyes were closed. Miss Palmer was also passed out on the couch. I decided not to wake her up. The coffee machine is down the hall. I walked fast and pressed the button of the machine. Hot coffee just started to pour in the cup when I heard a spine-chilling scream. I ran immediately and figured out it was coming from room number 1402, the room where Arnold is admitted. I grasped the doorknob and twisted it to open the door. But no matter how hard I tried, it didn't open. The scream that was coming from inside was of Miss Palmer. She was screaming in terrible pain. Miss Palmer, why did you lock the door? Open it. What the hell is going on inside? I couldn't wait and called the doctors immediately. The maintenance staff was called and he unlocked the door with a spare key. As soon as the door got open, we witnessed a vicious sight. Arnold had smashed the window of this fourth floor room with his plastered hand and also beat up his mom vigorously. Miss <laughs> Palmer was bleeding from her face and nose, but still, she was holding on to Arnold tightly screaming. Don't! I won't let you jump. No, Arnold, please. He was going crazy and throwing her around like a rag doll, trying to get to the window to jump out, saying the obscenest things I've ever heard come out of a teenager's mouth. The doctors ran to him and grabbed him. 
He was kicking in the air while screaming at the top of his lungs. Another nurse took Miss Palmer away to treat her wounds. For a moment, I forgot to act on this incident and stood like a statue. Julia, come here and help me with the injection. Hearing Dr. Stanley's voice brought me back to my senses. The incident of Arnold waking up from a vegetative state and moving to an extremely violent state left the entire hospital in terror. The doctors of our mental health team were called for his suicidal tendencies. Arnold showed episodes of anger and outrage. We had to keep his hands tied so that he couldn't hurt himself. His injuries were still in a critical stage, which is why we couldn't shift him to a mental institution yet. Cops came, and with the presence of the psychiatrist, did a full interview to dig up why he wants to end his life so desperately. After four to five sessions, he finally opened up. Arnold claimed that his teacher, Mr. Conan, physically abused him the day before he tried to commit suicide. I couldn't believe this was that same guy who came to visit Arnold that day in the hospital. Now I realize why his pulse increased with that man's presence. The cops eventually arrested Mr. Conan, but the man kept saying he was innocent and that Arnold was the one who persuades him to have relations. But the cops found inappropriate pictures of Arnold taken by his teacher. Arnold testified that Mr. Conan blackmailed him to release the pictures on the internet if he tried to tell anyone. Arnold also said this man abused another boy from his school. The boy named Matthew also testified against Mr. Conan. We all celebrated the day Mr. Conan got imprisoned. After a week more, Arnold got discharged from the unit. His parents were doing the paperwork on the counter while he sat in the wheelchair. I went close to him and said, You have been a brave boy. Never hurt yourself for someone else, Arnold. He looked at me with a hopeless face. I asked him again, Hey, you are finally going home to your people. You should smile, dear. He looked at me blankly and said, Thank you for everything. His father came and took him to the car. I was about to head to the office when a phone notification took place. I saw a handset was lying on the table nearby. I picked up and read a weird text. I have done what you told me to. The day I heard you blackmailing Mr. Conan to give you grades and nominate you for the scholarship, I knew it was you he was having an affair with. I felt disgusted to fall in love with a guy like you. But we are done now. You have blackmailed me too with my private pictures that you took. I want them back now. Before I could ponder what the hell this meant, I heard a sound behind me. Sorry, Nurse Julia. Arnold forgot his phone. Can I have it back? Miss Palmer stretched her hands toward me, and my heart dropped in fear. I handed over the phone to her. She took it and started to walk away. I slowly walked to the exit and noticed Arnold sitting in the back seat and typing on his phone that he just got from his mother. The car engine started, and he looked at me one final time and smiled ear to ear. I worked as cleaning staff in a local hospital. I was used to seeing people coming to the hospital in the worst way possible. But this one patient will always be remembered by me. His name was Billy, and he was admitted to the burn unit. I heard one night his house caught fire while he and his wife slept in their bedroom. By the time they figured out the lurking danger, half of the house was on fire. Billy was rescued by his neighbors and brought to the hospital, but his wife, Sandra, died in that fire. People say she was so severely burnt that her flesh melted leaving her body in ashes. Billy's left hand and left leg had serious injuries, but overall, he was in a curable condition. Among all the cabins in the hospital, his room was the only place that made my skin crawl. Every time I went there to clean, I could barely stand the smell of burnt flesh. And not just that, his room felt extremely cold. Billy was highly sedated with painkillers most of the time. Needless to say, the number of pain burns victims go through can't be explained in words. Anyways, one time I was assigned to the night shift. Honestly speaking, I preferred the night shifts more. I could work peacefully while all the patients slept. It was around 1.30 a.m. I went to mop the floors of Billy's room. As I entered the room, I saw a vicious looking figure standing in the middle of the room and sobbing. I recognized it was Billy seeing his burnt hand and limb. He was looking at the dark corner of the wall and whispering very creepily, Why? Why are you doing this to me? What more do you want from me? Please, I beg of you, leave me alone. 
Hey, man. Is everything all right? Billy turned at me and I saw the pain in his face. He then pointed at the dark corner and said, Tell her to go away. She keeps coming back. Isn't she supposed to stay dead? What are you talking about? Sandra, my wife. She keeps coming back for me. He then fainted on the floor. I was in such shock and fear that for a while, I didn't realize I had to inform the doctors and nurses. But when I did, they came rushing to his room. Everyone was shocked to see how, with such a painful condition, Billy managed to get out of the bed on his own. Since that night, every time I went to clean Billy's room, I was shit scared. I knew there was a logical explanation to all this, but trust me, when I stood inside that dark room in the middle of the night hearing nothing but Billy's deep breathing, I couldn't help but think, is his dead wife standing in that corner and watching me? Few days passed and Billy's condition worsened. He started to show signs of trauma and fear in his behavior. Many times, I could hear screams from his cabin and saw doctors and nurses rushing there to control him. I changed my shift just to avoid going to his room, but it seemed like life had different plans for me. One morning, my boss called me. He said they are willing to pay me double if I attended tonight's shift as well. Who doesn't need money in this world? So I agreed. Anyways, I had the next day off, so I knew I could pull this off. I went home and took a small nap before going back to the night shift. Hence, my head was clear enough to know what I saw that night, I saw that night. Like usual times, I began my cleaning. After five to six rooms, I decided to take a break and then do the rest. I went to the empty cafeteria to get a drink. I was standing in front of the vending machine when I heard footsteps in the distance. I looked and found Billy standing at the end of the corridor. His arm and leg were still covered with burn wounds. Half of his face was scarred. Hey, 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 Billy. What's going on? <sighs> Are you all right? Um, you should go back to your room, Billy. <sighs> I was becoming really disturbed seeing Billy this way. He was staring at me like a statue and breathing in a very scary way. Billy, you are scaring me, man. Why don't you? She won't rest until she kills me. Come on, Billy. Not again. No. She is telling me right now. She is standing right behind you and telling me to, to. I turned back and saw no one, but... An eerie feeling shivered down my spine. What Billy did next was the scariest thing I saw in my life. He took out a surgical knife and started cutting the flesh off his lips. Blood drops start to cover the white floor beneath him. But he didn't just stop there. He started to chew his lips. The munching sound started to make me nauseous. He screamed in pain while munching his flesh. Are you happy now? Are you? You are angry because I live, huh? Fine. I'm, I am ending this. I am ending everything now. Saying this, Billy started stabbing himself on the chest. It was bloodshed. Doctors and nurses came running. He was taken to the ICU right at that moment, but he didn't survive. I don't know why, but I feel like he did see his wife's ghost. Sometimes, people who die with desires in their heart come back to their loved ones and in some cases they haunt them too what do you think happened to billy back then all right that was three unsettling hospital horror stories by imr entertainment now, while we were watching that, I pulled five cards from the dead spread, and this is what I got. Tonight, the person we're connecting to was someone whom was a very judgmental person, who was wise, but still judgmental. Looking back on their life, they were a sharp tongue. Let no one use them as a doormat. Able to build their empire from the ground up. Very determined.
A lesson they would like to share is juggling burdens is a part of life. God will give you only what he thinks you can handle. Something they wish they'd paid more attention to is their past when they were there. So before their past became their past, you know, on certain milestones of their life, they wish they could have changed some stuff, experienced more. Now a message they would like to share is, enjoy your family. Let the world be pushed out away from what matters most to you. So in the background of this Ten of Cups, you see the world and it looking like it's going to hell in the far distance. As long as it's far enough away, you and your family should be at peace enjoying each other's company, making memories, all right? That's not to say that the world's going to stay that way forever, but keeping it at arm's length and not indulging in the drama and just enjoying the small moments that matter the most with your family is what you should really be doing. All right. I love you all. Thank you so much for listening to me. My name is Libra Empress. Please don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share. And I will see you for next week's Terror and Tarot with me, Libra Empress. Love you.